So another generation has come and gone, and this generation has been so special to me because it's the first one that I've experienced from beginning to end. I got myself my PS4 uh, just a couple of months after it came out in March 2014, and ever since then I've kept on top of the news, all the upcoming releases and things like that. It's the first one I've really sort of adulted my way through, I guess is the way of putting it. Uh, before that, I didn't get a PS3 until like 2010, uh, which is half the generation uh, into it, I finally got myself a PS3. And before that, the PS2 and the PS1, I was a kid, so I was relying on my parents. So I didn't really have a lot of say over which consoles I got, which games I got. It was all basically down to their budget, Christmas and all that sort of thing. So this is the first generation I've really experienced from beginning to the end. And as we're on the cusp of the PS5 and the Xbox Series X, I thought that a good thing to do right at this end of this generation is to talk about my personal top 10 favourite games of this generation. So these are just the 10 games that define this generation for me personally. Drop a comment in the comment section below and tell me which games genera you know, affected this generation for you the most. Uh, when I say this generation, I'm really just talking about the PS4, uh, the Xbox One and the Nintendo Switch. So without further ado, here are my top 10 games of this generation. Coming in at number 10 we've got Doom, now I personally only ever played the original Doom, obviously not when it first came out because I was two years old when it first came out, but I've played more recent sort of ports of it and I've not really been that familiar with it, it's not a game that I've spent a lot of time playing, so when the 2016 Doom came around it was essentially a new franchise for me which I think was kind of the idea to bring a lot of players into the franchise that maybe haven't experienced it before and Doom 2016 was my introduction to the series, and what an introduction it was. You know, uh, I wasn't really familiar with the premise, so the idea of being a, I guess, spaceman waking up on Mars to find that there's a portal to hell that's been opened up and you got to kill loads of demons on the surface of Mars, I was just there like, yeah, sign me up for that. And the soundtrack for Doom, I love heavy metal music, and... The soundtrack was just absolutely on point and it definitely helped with all the blood dripping down the walls for a lot of the levels and this very sort of very fucking metal vibe. The graphics were amazing, the gameplay was fantastic, a lot of the gory kills were something that I really looked forward to being able to do, even if a lot of them sort of repeated themselves a lot, they still were quite fun to pull off. Uh, the weapons were really had really good physics, they really were a lot of fun to utilise. There were a lot of creative ones, a lot of gory kills in this game, and that was right up my alley, you know. I haven't yet to play Doom Eternal, I'm hearing it's better than Doom, so once I play that, poten potentially that could actually replace Doom on this list. So uh, for now I've not played it, so Doom 2016, number 10 on this list. <laughs> Number nine, I've got Detroit Become Human. Now, personally, I'm into futurism. I love, I love researching and keeping up to date with the development of AI especially. It's something that's really, really close to me. Personally, it's something that I really, really love. And Detroit Become Human, in my opinion, wasn't just a game. It was kind of asking the questions that we as a species are going to have to start asking over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And start the sort of questions that I'm going to be around to see, that I'm going to see how we as a species tackle them. You know, um, AI, if it's alive, what rights do they have? If it's only simulating life, how, how close to simulating life is it that we still need to give them that, those rights, you know? Uh, what's the correct treatment for androids when they actually become, you know, this common everyday thing? You know, these questions of robot rights and AI intelligence, how far can it go, really interested me. And a lot of the sort of moral decisions that you make throughout the game really just added to the immersion. I really cared about a lot of the characters uh, and I really wanted to see them do well. So when I lost a character, um, that really hit me as well. And also there's sort of the real life parallels as well to Marcus's struggle in the real life Black Lives Matter movement and you know all these sort of tie-ins to the real world both in the future when it comes to AI, uh, the AI revolution, the singularity and that sort of thing and sort of the things we're dealing with now like 
race inequality and wealth inequality and all that sort of thing all blended together so well it didn't feel forced it didn't feel preachy and i think that it really sent across the right messages and it's an experience that i've chosen to have several times there's not a lot of games these days that i will play over and over and over again but detroit become human i've completed that game at least a couple of times and each and every time i pick a different path to go down and the game just finds new ways of surprising me In at number eight, we got Fallout 4. Now, I did play Fallout uh, New Vegas, but it's the only, that's the only Fallout game I played before this came out. So, I was stepping into the world of Fallout for pretty much the first time. I had to research a lot of the history behind it, and a lot of the history really played into the story that we're telling in Fallout 4. Now, I know this is, might be a bit of a controversial pick. A lot of people who have played Fallout for a long time uh, consider this to be one of the weaker entries, and I'm, I'm sure if I'd have... If I'd have played the older Fallout games, maybe I'd agree with you on that, but this was my entry into the Fallout series, I didn't really have much to base it on, and I really enjoyed what I played in Fallout 4. Uh, for a single player story, with I sunk hundreds of hours into this game, and the combat was great, the VAT system worked fantastic, there was really, uh, there's a lot of kills you can get that feel just really gratifying. And uh, the story of Fallout 4 as well was something that was very engaged in, so Fallout 4 is definitely one that I'm going to remember for a long time to come from this generation. <laughs> I love South Park, I've been watching it for many, many, many years, and when they announced the South Park Stick of Truth game, I was a bit worried because I've played a lot of other South Park games, and they're not great. So when Stick of Truth came out, it was fantastic. I loved every minute of it. However, number seven is not the Stick of Truth, it's the Fractured Butthole. They took everything that worked with the Stick of Truth, and they expanded upon it. Even the combat system just felt so much more engaging. There was just so much more fluidity to it. I really enjoyed it a lot more than the Stick of Truth. The Stick of Truth I can barely even go back and play based on the improvements they made in the Fracture of the Hole. They took the formula that worked and they added to it to the point where the Fractured Butt Hole is miles better than the Stick of Truth. And the Stick of Truth I really, really enjoyed. It's it's got the South Park wit. They've managed to make the graphics in the game look like the TV show with very little to discern the two which is mind-blowing to me because there's a lot of cartoony games that are made on console and, uh, and games out of that just don't look anything like what the cartoon counterparts are supposed to look like. This was almost completely indiscernible from its cartoon counterpart and that's incredible in my mind. And the writing was just completely on point. It really felt like I was playing an interactive South Park movie and that's exactly what you, what you want from a game like this. And if the Stick of Truth was a masterpiece, Fractured Butthole is just... What's better than a masterpiece? In at number 6, I've got Yu-Gi-Oh! Legacy of the Duelist slash Link Evolution. It's basically the same thing. Um, I'm a big Yu-Gi-Oh fan. I've been playing the TCG since 2002. I've had a few breaks here and there, but generally I've been in love with the card series. It's always been my favorite TCG. And we've never really had a, TC a Yu Gi Oh game on a console that, like an official release Yu Gi Oh game, that really invokes the, the sort of card game that we play in real life. You know, they've had games that have come close to it, like Forbidden Memories and all the other games that I never played, um, which are quite popular, but Legacy of the Duelist really just feels like the TCG on a PlayStation, or on a Switch, or on an Xbox, or whatever else. And in my opinion, they've done it so well that it's very sort of realistic to build a deck on there, try it out in real life, and it works the same way. They've essentially just adapted the rules of the TCG and put it in 
in this game. You know, especially when you're playing through the, the anime sort of story, you've still got the TCG rules there, right? It's not going by anime rules, it's going by TCG rules. I did a review on this channel when it first came out, and I was talking about how authentic the game felt, and that's something I really appreciate. It's something I didn't realise I needed so much, and when Yu-Gi-Oh! Legacy of the Daughters came out, it's something that I... It was one of those things where I didn't know how much I wanted it until I, until I had it in my hands. And then last year they came out with Link Evolution as well, which added the 2017 format. And Yu-Gi-Oh! Legacy of the Duelist is easily the best TCG game I've played. In at number 5 we got Spider-Man which was released in 2018, now at the time that this game was released I wasn't really into superhero stuff, I sort of turned my nose up at it a little bit, I wasn't into the MCU, I didn't read the comics and um, all that sort of stuff. Uh, Spider-Man came out and the game was so good, it looked so good that I ended up buying it and I loved it and it was so good that I ended up going back to watch the MCU films and fell in love with them. <laughs> it was one of those things where I didn't realise exactly what I've been turning my nose up at, you know, I really enjoyed these films. So Spider-Man sort of really introduced me to that to that world essentially and the combat was fantastic, it was really fun playing as Spider-Man, dodging bullets and in the middle of a dodge shooting a web at an enemy and tying them up to a wall and that sort of thing it was really fun. The story was really engaging, I really cared about the, the characters, even J. Jonah Jameson, the, the, essentially the dickhead of the game is someone that you can really sort of understand where he's coming from. There's a lot of these engaging characters in the game. And I haven't actually finished the DLC story, I'm going to get around to doing that. But in terms of the main story, I can't fault it. You know, Miles and the, the struggles he's going through, I really identified with that. And uh, you got Peter Parker trying to keep his identity secret from his, you know, his, from his aunt while volunteering at the homeless shelter and also trying to take down the bad guys who are, who are getting released from prison. you got to try and find out who it is. It turns out to be his mentor. Like, that's really engaging stuff, you know? Uh, I wasn't really familiar with a lot of the villains. I was familiar with Doc Ock because I played the original Spider-Man game on the PS1, and so I was familiar with him. But I wasn't really familiar with a lot of these other Spider-Man villains, so it introduced me to a lot of these others as well. And I'm really looking forward to Miles Morales on the PS5 because the, the universe they've created with this Spider-Man game really enthralled me, really brought me in, and it's something I'm really looking forward to continu continuing to see how it expands in generations to come. Up next we've got Mario Odyssey. Now Mario was one of the first games I really got to play as a kid. Uh, the old sort of Super Mario Brothers and Mario Brothers 2 and Mario World especially. And Mario 64 as well was a big game for me. Mario Odyssey really brought me in. I bought my Switch and it came with Mario Odyssey and I thought, alright, I'll, I'll play Mario Odyssey. I'll see what it's like. I hadn't enjoyed a Mario game properly and I played Mario Odyssey and... <laughs> Yeah, there was a lot of heart behind that. A lot of the issues I'd had with Mario up until that point had gone away. <laughs> yeah, um, there's a level in it that I still just put on Mario Odyssey just to fight. The love letter. The history, the love letter to the history of Mario. And you go 2D and you have the sort of the rehash of the Donkey Kong. And it's just sort of that sort of love, love note to the history of Mario and where it comes from. And it really made me go sit there and think, this is why I loved Mario before. This is why I absolutely love this, this, ser this series of games. And a lot of the worlds are also creative as well. I love the beach one. I can't remember the name of all these kingdoms, I'm really sorry. Um, but this, uh, you can take control of a Tyrannosaurus Rex by throwing your hat at it. Need I go on? I don't think I need to mention anything else. But Mario Odyssey really was, in my opinion, from my perspective, a return to form for Mario. There's not really a Mario game between Mario 64 and Mario Odyssey that I can point to and say, yeah, that game really drew, really, really drew me in. Mario Odyssey really did. <laughs> In 
In at number three, we've got easily the hardest game on this list. We've got Cuphead. Now, I did originally get Cuphead on the Xbox One uh, because I had an Xbox One at the time because I did briefly have one during this generation. And when I sold my Xbox One, it's the one game I really missed. So when it was re-released on the Switch, I bought it the day it came out. And Cuphead is one of those games that is everything I generally hate about games. The overly hard for the sake of being hard, gun running, bus fighting, sort of that sort of thing. I generally don't go for that sort of thing. It's why I won't play Demon Souls. I don't like games that are hard for the sake of being hard. But Cuphead had this charm that really drew me to it. And even though I die more times than I'm, I care to admit, although the Wishing Well on Second Island is definitely happy to remind me, Cuphead's one of those games that's going to... I've not completed it. It's been a year and a half and I've still not completed it. In fact, it's been months since I've even gone back to it. But I will. And I'll complete a few levels and then I'll leave it alone for another few months. It's one of those games where I really just have to really be in the mood to play it. But there's that charm to it that keeps me coming back. In at number two, we've got Octopath Traveler. It's a turn-based RPG exclusive to the Nintendo Switch, although it's been re-released on the PC as well. Uh, stylized after sort of the old 16-bit uh, RPGs, and that's the charm of the game. There's a lot, of, there's a lot of charm in the characters themselves as well. Uh, it's centered around eight characters: Albrecht, Cyrus, Tressa, Ophelia, Primrose, Alfin, Therion, and Hannet. And you basically pick a team of any combination of the four, although if you're doing a quest that's very specific to a character, you'll have to have that character in your party as well, and you'll battle with the four of them. And they've each got their individual roles, like for example, uh, Ophelia is the cleric, so she will have not only moves that can attack the opponent with magic, but she's also got magic that will heal your teammates. Yeah, it's a very sort of RPG, each character's got their own role, you've got swordsmen, you've got someone who can um, control animals, she can tame them, you can she can then use them in battle, that being had it. And um, there's other things, there's characters with magic abilities, there's characters that are proficient with swords, and you've got to try and uh, pick the correct team basically, the correct team arrangement to actually try and get through the game, leveling them up individually as well, so you might neglect a character for so long and then realise, damn I actually have to use them now, and they'll be very under leveled, so you've got to use your other characters to sort of help them through. and. There's a lot of strategy involved in this game. It's quite a long game as well. It came out two years ago. I haven't actually completed it. I'm about halfway through it. Uh, but I'm really enjoying everything that I've played of it. And um, Octopath Travel is one of those games that's really stuck with me. Uh, I bought t-shirts. I've bought mugs. I've bought posters. I've got all sorts of stuff of Octopath Traveler. And it's one of those games that no matter how long I spend not playing it, I'll always go back to it. I'll always remember, I've still got to do this Octopath Traveler. And I'll want to go back and do it. It's not a chore. You know, there's a lot of games in my backlog that I'm just there like, oh, I've got to complete that game, but I don't want to, don't, can't really be bothered. I can always be bothered with Octopath Traveler. It, in my opinion, it is the best game I ever released on the Switch to date. And I'll always have time to go back and play it. I have absolutely, well and truly fallen in love with this game. <laughs> And at number one, my favourite game of this generation, Horizon Zero Dawn. Aloy is a very, very relatable main character. She doesn't feel like she fits in, she's sort of an outcast. And she discovers that even though she's not quite, she, there's something about her that's different from everybody else. And you'll learn what that is as the game goes on. Uh, and as you also find out, uh, why the world is the way it is. For those of you who are not familiar, it's set a thousand years in our future and civilization has crumbled and the only thing that remains are a few tribes are primitive humans. Aloy is not a part of any of these tribes. She has been raised outside of that clique and 
everything's overgrown. All of our buildings, our infrastructure is crumbling down and nature is taking back hold. And the only thing that exists outside of all of that is robot animals. And you've got to try and find out how the world got to be the way it is. There are audio logs and video logs left over from a thousand years in the past. And you find out exactly why the world is the way it is. And it was completely gripping and completely engaging all the way through. Every single character in that game, even the small, insignificant characters, are characters I care about. They're characters I really want to know more about. And outside of Aloy herself, you've got other characters like Silence as well. He, I can't put my finger on whether or not he's this villainous, whether or not he's some sort of hero. I've completed the game and I still don't know. I'm, I can't wait for Horizon 2 to find out what the f*** is going on with Cyrus. But Horizon Zero Dawn, in my opinion, really sums up this generation. It was a brand new IP, and in my opinion, putting a brand new IP at number one really signifies the quality of this generation. You've got other series as well that I wanted to put on this list, Mortal Kombat, and all sorts of other things, Smash Bros, that have got years worth of dedication and history and fan base and building upon them. To put a new IP introduced to this generation at number one just speaks volumes about the quality of this generation. And the story's gripping. There's always an answer, but then a question when going through this game to try and find out what the hell has happened to the planet. So, that's been my list of the top 10 games of this generation. Please drop a comment in the comment section below and tell me what games you enjoyed. And don't forget to subscribe and like the video. I'm a small time YouTuber, so any and all support is appreciated. I will like and I will reply to almost every comment I get. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.